Okay. Hello. Um, right. So I'm going to start talking about the transcendental deduction. Um, setup isn't ideal today. Right? So, um, as I said last time, as I understand it, the metaphysical deduction, which was the reading for last time, and remember the official title is the clue to the discovery of all pure concepts of the understanding, but Kant himself calls it the metaphysical deduction later. So the metaphysical deduction, um, as I understand it, shows that... Um, Experience must conform to the categories if our empirical consciousness is going to have an object, right? That is, if we're going to be able to form, successfully form an empirical concept of something, then, um, then since the categories are, we claim to have shown, are the fundamental parts of our capacity to form empirical concepts. Um, if we successfully have an empirical concept, its object must conform to the categories. So the transcendental deduction is supposed to show that experience actually will conform. So there is an object of experience. Um, and in the A edition, Kant calls this the transcendental object. This is it like this very well today. Transcendental objects. What would that be? I mean, here's another, yet another use of the term transcendental, and here applied to a kind of object. So I think a transcendental object is an object described by transcendental predicates. So the, the object that we show the existence of in the transcendental deduction um, is described only by transcendental predicates. So that's why in the A edition, Kant calls it the transcendental object. Um, however, um, he never he doesn't use that phrase anymore in the B edition. And I think he felt it was misleading um, because um, you might think that this is some mysterious kind of object um, that's different from an empirical object. And I mean, it is and it isn't. It's different from an empirical object um, in that we haven't filled in any empirical details. But it is an empirical object, right? That's the only kind of object we can refer to. So I, I believe the phrase that replaces transcendental object in the B edition is nature in general. Um, he doesn't use that until section 26. So that wasn't in today's reading. Um, uh, and it, there he also gives a Latin equivalent there, natura materialit materialiter spectata. I wrote that wrong, but that's what it just said. Um, nature considered materially, right? That is nature considered as an object. He contrasts that to nature considered formally, which basically is the understanding itself. Um, so, um, 
So the object that we're trying to show the existence of is the object of empirical consciousness in general. Um, and I mean, uh, that's as much as we could show without taking into account something a posteriori. And it's not very clear how we could show even that much. Um, so, uh, so to do this, although these are not official divisions, right? Like they don't have a place in the table of contents. It seems pretty clear that the transcendental deduction in the B edition has two parts. Um, so the first part um, is, well, through section 20, so the reading for today. And the second part is sections 21 to 26. That is the reading for next time. Um, and uh, at the end of section 20, he says what it is we've accomplished in the first part. Um, so this is on B143. It's on page 160 in Kemp Smith. Uh, consequently, the manifold in a given intuition is necessarily subject to the categories. Now, I mean, right, that is, so if you understand what that means, it's going to sound like we've actually finished at the end of section 20. What the manifold, that is, what is manifold in a given intuition is necessarily subject to the categories means that um, um, if I have a sensible intuition, then I can use the types of rules prescribed by the categories to unify it, to unify what is manifold in it. That is, we've already shown that the, the categories have an object, it seems like. So what, do you, what does section 21 through 26 add? Um, so, uh, let me switch back to the book here. This is the end of um, B144, and it, so it's on page 161. In what follows, it will be shown from the mode in which the empirical intuition is given in sensibility that its unity is no other than that which the category, according to section 20, prescribes to the manifold of a given intuition in general. So um, the mode, remember I said, uh, when Kem Smith translates Erkentnisse as modes of knowledge, there's no word in German that he's translating as mode. But here, there is a word that he's translating as mode. The word is art, and all nouns are capitalized in German, capital A. Great, art. So um, 
arts can mean uh, a way of doing things, uh, just a way, it could be translated as way. <laughs> um, it can mean a kind of thing, um, but it's also the technical term for um, It's also the technical term for species. So you might also translate this as species. Now let me read what it says again. Um, in what follows, it will be shown from the species in which empirical intuition is given in sensibility, the specific way in which the empirical intuition is given in sensibility, that its unity is no other than that which the category prescribes to the manifold of a given intuition in general. So it seems like what Kant is saying here is that uh, in this part, he talked about a sensible intuition in general. Whereas in this part, he's going to talk about our specific form of sensible intuition. Um, and uh, if you look at the contents, you'll see that I think that's borne out. So in the, and this is one of the big changes between the A version the transcendental deduction is one of the places that he completely rewrote. It's the main place that he completely rewrote for the B edition. He just took out almost all of the A text and replaced it with new text with a completely different organization and everything. And the, the A deduction wasn't divided into two parts this way. And in fact, the A deduction begins basically by talking about the order of time how all our representations must find their place in time. The B deduction, the reading for today basically didn't mention time at all. It mentions space in an example, and that's about it. And all of a sudden, when we get to section, the second part of the deduction, we'll find he's talking about time order. So um, so I think that's the right way to understand what happens here. Now, I mean, that's hard to understand, though, because if it's true that this shows that, um, that any sensible intuition in general, and let me read one more thing from section 21. So I know section 21 is, is from next week's reading, but, um, but I'm going ahead to, sh to show you what it says. Um, but in the above proof, there is one feature from which I could not abstract, the feature namely that the manifold to be intuited must be given prior to the synthesis of understanding and independently of it. How this takes place remains here undetermined. Right. So I think what that what that means is that in the um in this first part, he abstracted from anything specific to our form of sensible intuition, but he didn't abstract from the fact that it is a sensible intuition. That is, that they an intellect the the order in the object of an intellectual intuition would be derived from the um from the intellect itself so um I mean, my computer's trying to update in the middle of this anyway no way all right um So what the first part shows, that is, um, okay, sorry, I got distracted. If I had, if we had an intellectual intuition, then the order in the object would be derived from a principle in us. 
the sensible intuition means that the manifold in the a given intuition is not derived from a principle in us. It's derived from a principle in the object. Um, so, right, that's what he means when he says, I couldn't abstract from this feature that um, the manifold in an intuition is given prior independently of the understanding. It means he's not abstracting from the fact that our our intuition is sensible and our intellect is discursive. Um, Right, and that's why he goes on in that same paragraph to say, for were I to think an understanding, which is itself intuitive, as for example, a divine understanding, et cetera, et cetera, the categories would have no meaning whatsoever in respect to such a mode of knowledge. Right, the categories are are parts of the form of discursive intellection. I'm not sure if I ever said that discursive is the opposite of intuitive here. Right, the discursive intellect. Is the opposite of an intuitive intellect. So a discursive intellect is an intellect that requires a non, oops. A discursive intellect is the, intellect is the opposite of an intuitive intellect. So a discursive intellect is one that is not intuitive and therefore requires an intuition which is not intellectual, namely a sensible intuition to go along with it. So, um, so what Kant is saying that he showed in this part is that for any discursive intellect, that is, for any understanding that has to um, get its objects through a sensible intuition, the categories must apply to its object. And then here we show that the categories must apply to the object of our intuition specifically. So you might think, isn't this just a special case of that, right? Like if you've shown it's true for any discursive intellect in general, then of course it has to be true for us. So, I mean, I I think it's possible to understand why, I mean, the, but I'm gonna talk about it more next time. I mean, you know, roughly speaking, it again has to do with the fact that when we think of a discursive intellect in general, without restricting it to the specific case we know about, we don't know if we're thinking about anything possible. Right, the only example we know is possible is the one we know is actual. So, um, so all of this, um, it shows something about the concept of dis di discursive intellection. It shows that if that concept has an object, <laughs> then its object has an object, so to speak. But, um, but to show that that concept has an object, you then have to give the one example we know of. And that's what's gonna happen in section 23, one through 26. Okay, so that's the overall structure of the B deduction as I understand it. And again, the A deduction is interesting to read. It's completely different. Um, I, you know, um, um, I guess in some courses, in many courses, you would read both of them. But first of all, that would leave no time to read other parts of the book. And second of all, I, 
I feel like that's confusing. Then at that point, you're not re re you're not really reading either of the books that Kant actually read. So uh, like it's better to you know if you're interested in the A deduction, go on and look at it later sometime. Um, or like I said, when I first taught this course for a couple of years, I taught only the A, a edition, and then we didn't read the B deduction. All right. So anyway, so so that's the structure of the B deduction. So now I'm going to concentrate on the first part and see how it's supposed to work. Um, so so what are we asking for? Um, when we ask to show that the manifold in an intuition, that is what is manifold in an intuition must be quote, subject to the categories. Um, okay, so first of all, an empirical concept, right? So forget the forget the categories, which are pure pure a priori concepts, and just think about a regular empir empirical concept like cinnabar. Um, so an empirical concept is an intellectual representation, or so to speak, the intellectual part of a representation, right? Remember, I drew it this way before that it, you really need both parts to refer to the objects. So if this concept is the concept cinnabar, then the object is cinnabar. And this is a sensible or empirical intuition. That is, it's the act, it's an act of my faculty of sensible intuition, and it's an act that's brought about by the object, cinnabar, affecting me, causing a sensation in me. Um, okay, so what does it mean to say that this representation is intellectual? Well, again, as I've said before, it means it's active. And active means that it consists in my rule to which the object must conform. So there's some one rule or principle in the subject of the intellectual representation to which any object of it must conform. So, um, So whenever I represent what's actually manifold in the object of actual sensations as all conforming to some one rule, then by definition, that representation of unity is intellectual, that is not sensible, right? It doesn't matter whether there's also a principle in the object to which they all conform because I can't use the principle in the object to represent things. It's in the object, it's not in me. Right, so if I'm able to represent unity in the manifold, uh, in what is manifoldly given, <laughs> um, um, that unity has to come from me.
right? And that's why um, um, Kant says the representation of synthetic unity can never be, quote, borrowed from the object. Right, the object, the object presumably, the object does have a rule. I mean, that's what we're going to prove, basically, <laughs> that it has to, right? But the object does have a rule, but I can't borrow that rule to represent it because it's in the object, not in me. Um. And similarly, when he says at the beginning of the transcendental deduction, so this is B129. Um, um, the combination conjunctio, that suggests that this word should be translated as conjunction, right? Since he gave um, conjunctio as the Latin equivalent, but there's reasons that Kemp Smith didn't do that. Anyway, the combination conjunctio of a manifold in general can never come to us through the senses. Why is that? Again, it's true by definition. If you understand what he means by the combination of the manifold or conjunction of the manifold, the um, so and again of a manifold or of the manifold means of something manifold, <laughs> of something that's not one. And now I'm going to represent it as together as one. So for the it's the same thing I was just saying. That unity always has to be active. So it always has to be an intellectual representation. And it can that is, so it can never come to us through the senses. We can't borrow it from the object. Um, on the other hand, there's nothing to prevent the object borrowing a principle of unity from me. Um, but at least from a theoretical point of view, um, our intellect doesn't work that way, right? That's the way a divine intellect would work. So this principle, the, 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 what would make the principle and the object identical to my principle would be not that I borrowed it from the object, but that the object borrows it from me. And again, that's why I said an intellectual intuition would prescribe the order to its object according to which everything manifold in it follows. The object would emanate from it, to use the Neoplatonic terminology. So there, there's nothing, there's no contradiction in that, but that's not our form of intellect. Um, so since we can't do that and we can't borrow the principle from the object, we have to take our principle and hope the object conforms to it. Um, okay, so that's one point. Now, another thing is, and even though Kant isn't going to start talking about the imagination explicitly until the next part of the deduction, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Um, because he is implicitly talking about it when he talks about synthesis. Um, so in order to apply a single rule to something manifold, it has to first be collected together. And that collection is what Kant usually calls synthesis. So um, let me make some more space in here. 
right? Here's the empirical concept, cinnabar. Here's the intuition, which is manifold. There's something manifold in it. I want to represent all of this manifold as conforming to a single rule. In order to do that, it has to be first all collected together so it can be compared to the rule. And that collection together is synthesis. Whereas this is unity of synthesis. Or sometimes he says synthetic unity. And I mean, or sometimes he isn't that careful and he calls them both synthesis. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but when he is being careful, for example, like that paragraph I read last time that comes right before the table of categories where he says, like in order to represent an object, I have to have first a manifold and intuition. Second of all, synthesis by the means of the imagination and third unity of synthesis, which is the function of the understanding, right? That's when he's using his terminology strictly, that's what he calls them. So, um, So when we ask whether a particular empirical concept is in good order, so to speak, um, we can ask, first of all, and this is the formal logical question, is this rule a good rule? Meaning, is it self-consistent, right? Is this really one rule or does it contradict itself? Suppose it passes that test, so it's um, self-consistent. And now Kant will say, like, I can think it's object, but I can't necessarily know or successfully represent or refer to its object. So there's a further question you can ask, and this is the um, transcendental question about this concept. Um, is it capable of referring to an object? And because of the way this works, what that's equivalent to is, are we able to collect what's manifold in intuition in such a way that it conforms to this rule? Right? Is the corresponding synthesis at least possible? So without that, we can't use the intellectual representation that is the concept objectively. Right? It may be okay as a mode of the subject because it's not self-consistent, not inconsistent, but um, but we can't use it to refer to an object because um we um, can't collect a manifold in such a way as to compare it to this rule and see that it conforms. And again, as he said already in the metaphysical deduction, the faculty in us that performs this synthesis is what he calls the imagination. So why does he not talk about the imagination in the first part of the deduction? And I think the answer is because the imagination is um, specifically our faculty. When he finally defines what the imagination is, it's gonna be in terms of representing things even though they're not present. Right, so like the, the what the imagination does, and this in a sense is a standard definition of imagination, right? Like the like um, Aristotle's use of fantasia, which is translated as imagination. Um, the people in 100b, the people in 100c, when they talk about imagination, they're all talking about kind of like seeing something even though it's not there. Um but it was there or something like that, right? So it's like bringing remembered 
uh, sensations together with the present ones in order to see if they all conform to a rule. Um, so this is that's what this synthesis. If we if we leave the abstract um, region of the first part of the deduction and come back down to our own case, what this synthesis is is you know the way like as you sense something by laws of association, uh, like other things you've sensed before are like brought up and combined with it. And like you put those things together and see uh, if it conforms to your rule. Um, but again, the first part of the deduction abstracts from all that. And so even though like, to, to draw this, of course, I have to draw it in space. Again, like, we don't know if it's possible for this to be done any other way. So whenever we're thinking about it, we're really thinking about space and time, right? And this, this line here basically represents, I guess it represents both space and time. <laughs> Right. That is the, the in intuition. There's both a spatial and a temporal manifold, and I'm representing that by this line. Um, but but in fact, in the first part of the deduction, we're supposed to be forgetting the fact that the only way we know how to think about this is as spread out in space and time. Somehow, there's something not unified in a sensible intuition, and there has to be some way of collecting it and comparing it to the single rule of an intellectual representation. Okay, so um, I'm getting to the explanation of what deduction means <laughs> and what it, and therefore what a transcendental deduction is specifically. Um, so Kant compares the formal um, subjective possession of a concept to the possession de facto of a piece of real property. Right, the, the, the whole, there's, there's a judicial metaphor. He compares, so, when I, when I possess a concept in the sense that I have a rule and it's not self-contradictory, then he compares that to when I possess a piece of land, I'm actually living there and using the land. And he compares the ability to perform the corresponding synthesis to the possession of title to the land. Right, so if I possess the concept legitimately, that means I'm able to display my title to it. That is, I'm able to display my ability to perform the corresponding synthesis. And deduction, as he explains in the initial like introduction to the, the, the deduction in general, as he explains, deduction is a technical legal term in civil law, right? Civil law, if people don't know that, so civil law basically means Roman law, right? Civil law means law of the city. <laughs> Which city? Rome, right? <laughs> so it's like, it means, in this context, it means Roman law, but it, it means Roman law insofar as it forms the basis of most legal systems in continental Europe, as opposed to common law, which which is the basis of um uh the english legal system and its descendants right so in so in civil law terminology deduction is the term for the part of a proceeding where you display your title to property so like it so it, it it's being used here in that technical legal sense 
not in the usual sense that it's used in logic to mean like deducing a consequence from premises or something like that. I mean, there is an argument here, but the categories are not the conclusion of the argument. The conclusion of an argument has to be a judgment, right? Not a concept. So we're not deducing the categories in that logical sense. We're giving, we're performing a deduction of the categories, which means we're showing our title to them, which means we're showing the, that we must have the ability to perform the corresponding synthesis. Now, in the case of an empirical concept like cinnabar, it's easy to show that we have title to it. At least Kant seems to think it's easy. I mean, there can definitely be problems with this. Um, and I feel like Kant is maybe not sufficiently aware of that. Um, but, um, but at least if everything goes well, again, I've said this before, the way we got, how did we come up with this rule? Well, the synthesis came first, actually, right? Like the imagination following its own laws of association or whatever started bringing up certain things together. Um, and I mean, Kant says the imagination in its... It, it, um, in in the realm of aesthetics, in the, I mean, in the way Kant doesn't want to use it in the preface here, later he kind of liberalized that a bit. But in the realm of aesthetics, that is in the realm of like appreciation of beauty or whatever, Kant says that the imagination is doing something else, something more free or whatever. But in, in this theoretical realm, the understanding is always trying to produce things that could be unified by a concept. Right, it's always bringing things together for the purpose of it's it's like serving the understanding. Um, again, this right, this is all metaphorical. There aren't little people inside us called the understanding and the imagination and serving each other and whatever. But um, but still, like our capability of collecting things together is a capability of collecting them together for the purpose of unifying them according to a rule. And that's what happens when we acquire an empirical concept. So after I've experienced cinnabar sufficiently, at least that's the way the concept is first formed. I mean, I haven't experienced cinnabar very much. Where did I get the concepts? I've seen a piece of it once, like in a museum or something. <laughs> but that's not where I got the concept, I don't think. Um, but in any case, uh, but let's let's ignore that, right? So I, after I've experienced cinnabar enough, the imagination starts producing its characteristics, collecting its characteristics, red, heavy, toxic, whatever, um, together and in such a way that the understanding is able to say, oh, this can be unified by a rule. And that at that point, the concept cinnabar is formed. And so the concept is formed in such a way that it brings its title with it. Right, so, so an empirical deduction and right, so Kant calls, the way he uses this phrase kind of shifts a little bit as he goes on in the discussion, I, 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 I fear. But um, at least, so I guess you could say he what he calls an empirical deduction is the kind of thing that would be a deduction for an empirical concept. So that is, if some if I'm going around using the concept cinnabar and someone, so I, I'm in possession of it, right? That is, I have the rule. And then someone asks me to, to demonstrate my title. Well, all I have to do is explain how I acquired it. Right, I just go back to the way the imagination collected the manifold in order to allow it to be unified by this rule. 
And that demonstrates my title. So an empirical deduction of a concept is showing how we acquired it. And for an empirical concept, that does demonstrate title. So it is a deduction for an empirical concept. However, as Kant also says, for the same reason, we don't usually ask for a deduction of an empirical concept, right? I mean, again, maybe but the examples Kant gives are not great. Like he gives these examples like fate, um, which doesn't seem to be an empirical concept at all, seems to be the problem with it. But, you know, sometimes there are times when people are using a concept that's purported to be empirical, like phlogiston. Right? Phlogiston, if you don't know, is part of an older theory of chemistry, according to what to, to which when we say a reaction is happening where something is absorbing oxygen, they would say it's giving off phlogiston. Um, so like what we call a uh, metal oxide, they called an earth and they regarded the corresponding metal, which we think of as that metal without the oxide part as a, as a compound of the earth and phlogiston. <laughs> right. And it was actually, a, a, it's a theory that explains certain things. It was not a ridiculous theory. It worked up to a certain point. Uh, but then it turned out that, yeah, there really is no such thing as phlogiston. Um, so again, I think like Kant doesn't, isn't really thinking about that type of example. Um, but in any case, so uh, like normally the suspicion doesn't come up because normally not only did you acquire it by um, going through the synthesis already, but every time you use it, <laughs> you demonstrate yet again that it's objective, right? So like every time you find a piece of cinnabar and you're able to unify it using this concept, you've once again shown that it has an object. Um, Okay, so that's empirical concepts. You can give an empirical deduction of them, but you don't usually need to give a deduction. But if you need to, it's pretty easy and that's how you do it. Um, I guess. Um, so what about the case of a geometrical concept? Um, but I mean, suppose this is the concept triangle. Um, So in this case, uh, an empirical deduction is not going to work because if Kant is right, so, I mean, we still do have these steps, right? So in this case, the object is a triangle. You might say, well, wait, are, are perfect triangles ever given an empirical intuition? I mean, um, in every empirical intuition, there are things in different directions and it's a direction between them. I remember that was my little explanation of why the concept triangle is part of our capability of sensible intuition. Um, so, I mean, this isn't a, like a piece of cardboard shaped like a perfect triangle. 
but it's a triangle. It's a triangular space. Every intuition includes a triangular space, I think. Um, so the answer is, um, yes, if you understand in what way a triangle can be given in empirical intuition, it's always given in empirical intuition. But we didn't get the concept triangle by first, according to Kant, we couldn't have got the concept triangle by um, like first collecting manifold um, in an intuition, performing a synthesis of the imagination and then unifying that by a concept. Because you can see, I already drew a triangle here. <laughs> we're seeing why it has to be a priori, right? We can't collect a manifold together without, unless it's a manifold spread in space. <laughs> and that means spread along the base of a triangle with us at the apex, basically. Um, so, uh, so we so um, so some somehow things went the other direction, right? Like we had to know that this type of synthesis, in which we regard an object as a triangle, is possible, so to speak, before we ever encounter an object. Again, it's so to speak, right? There wasn't a time before. I I mean, I don't know if I'm repeating this too much, except that. I feel like it's confused not just students, but like serious caught interpreters. <laughs> so, so I want it. That's why I keep repeating it. There wasn't a time before experience when I uh, like somehow found out that that synthesis was possible, and then I started having experience. Um, but nevertheless, like, um. I didn't first learn that I didn't learn that the synthesis is possible because it occurred in experience. Um, because on the contrary, the possibility of that synthesis is a condition for the possibility of experience. Um, So if we need, right, and so therefore, although Kant agrees with Locke, so right, this is important, and I mean, he actually mentions Locke when he talks about this. It's more when he's talking about the, the intellectual, the pure intellectual concepts as the categories, but I think the same thing applies to the geometrical concepts. He agrees with Locke, that we actually acquired these concepts in the course of experience. That is, we're not born with this, we're not born using this concept. Um, but nevertheless, the way we acquired it from experience didn't give us a title to it. Because the concept we claim to possess is a concept that um, um, is a concept of a way experience has to be, of a, con of a necessary condition for the possibility of experience. So um, the, however we in fact acquired this as we were growing up, um, we didn't thereby gain a title to it. So if you ask me, if I go around using the concept triangle and you ask me, hold on a second, where do you get a right to that concept? Um, I can give an empirical deduction. This is where I think there's a little bit of a shift here. I can give an empirical deduction, but now it's not really a deduction, <laughs> right? That's I'm doing the thing that would be an empirical deduction if we were talking about an empirical concept. And, and Kant says, that's what Locke does. And he says, it's a valuable service. It's really interesting, right? To learn at what point, you know, how the, how the mind first 
like you know mounts from particulars to general concepts and whatever he says that's really interesting but that whole story doesn't display our title to the concept when it's not an empirical concept so if you want a deduction of the concept triangle you would need a different kind of deduction and in fact Kant says you would already need a transcendental deduction and in fact he says now it's like now you tell us why didn't you mention this before <laughs> but he says at some point that in the aesthetic we've performed a transcendental deduction of the concept of space right so we've already seen a transcendental deduction in fact the, tr the aesthetic contained the transcendental deduction of the concept of space um and, um, well, I mean, I mean, you can see, roughly speaking, why that would be right. The aesthetic showed our right to the concept of space, showed where our title comes to, from. That is, it showed how we know that um, the concept of space uh, can be used to represent the objects of our sensible intuition. That is, can be used to represent whatever affects us and causes sensations in us, right? So whatever is manifold in the intuition, we know can be represented as in space. Right. I mean, we know it can be represented using the concept of space. Remember, the concept of space is not the same as space. Space is the intuition. But the it can we know that whatever um, is manifold in the intuition can be represented using the concept of space because space itself is the form of external intuition. So um, so whatever is manifold in space is already spatially ordered. And the concept of space is like a concept we form by abstraction from the possible spatial orders. Um, so, uh, so our title to it, that is, we know we can do this kind of synthesis where we take what's empirical in, the, in, the, in an intuition and collect it in such a way that make this the concept space. The concept triangle is like a species of the concept space, right? Remember, the concept space is the concept of a space. <laughs> so, um, we know that whatever is manifold in the intuition, we have to be able to collect it in such a way as to represent it with the single rule that says these things are in spatial order. Because we know that the man, whatever is manifold in the intuition is already in spatial order. <laughs> so like that's how the aesthetic works. So it's not an empirical deduction, but it's still kind of similar to an empirical deduction in the sense that, right, so rather than saying, well, I got this concept by actually experiencing its object and actually experiencing the object meant performing the synthesis, and therefore this concept clearly refers to a synthesis that I'm able to, to perform. Now we're saying, I got this concept from um, a fundamental feature of the way uh, a manifold could be given to me in experience in general. So it's a priori, but it's still, so to speak, derived from my ability to sense things. Right, rather than from my rather than from my ability to to sense cinnabar, and the reason I know I'm able to sense cinnabar is because I have sensed cinnabar, right? 
Um, so rather than from my ability to sense cinnabar, it's derived from my ability to sense anything using my form of sensible intuition. Okay, so again, the this transcendental deduction of the concept of space or the concept of a space is, um, uh, although it's hard and harder to understand than an empirical deduction, it's not that hard, I think Kant thinks. And that's, again, why the aesthetic is the short part of the, of the doctrine of elements. Right, it's relatively straightforward to show our title to these concepts, geometrical and arithmetical concepts, presumably. Um, well, there's things about that that are harder to understand, but um, Okay, but what about a pure intellectual concept? Um, no, wait, why? Do I not start talking about this at this point in my notes? I don't know, but I, I will talk about it. What about a pure intellectual concept? Well, so a pure intellectual concept, um, It's a rule to which an object must conform, or it's a rule that a rule has to conform to, to be the kind of rule that an object will perform to. <laughs> right? It's as I was, as I read Kant saying last time, the categories are not so much knowledge of objects as the forms of knowledge of objects. Um, Right, they're the capability of forming empirical concepts. So, I mean, right, like if this is the concept of cause, so, um, So if I'm going to have an empirical concept, then a feature of the empirical concept is its ability to represent its object as cause and effect. Right? So let me bring the empirical concept back in here for a second. So the empirical concept cinnabar includes, as I was discussing last time, the capability of represent, representing cinnabar as one, right, as all the same. It includes the capability of representing cinnabar as plural, as like self-different. And it also, as you go down the table to other categories, it uh, includes the capability of representing cinnabar as cause. And I guess I should say, in representing the states of cinnabar as effects. Um, we'll see that Kant says that the cause is always a substance and the effect is always a state of a substance, a change in state of a substance. Right. So, um, so uh, like part of this empirical concept is the ability to represent its object as a cause. But it's a transcendental part of it, right? That is, it's a part that comes logically before um, any of the specific things it represents about cinnabar, even that just represents it as existing. It comes before that. Um, so that is, um, if objects can't be given to me as causes, 
then I can't form this empirical concept or any other. So I'm, so to speak, demanding that the object behave a certain way, because if it doesn't, so there's something I'm going to have to be able to do here. This is what Kant is going to call the schema of the category of cause. There's something I'm going to have to be able to do here, which is collecting my experience of cinnabar in such a way as to make cinnabar appear as a cause. It's not very mysterious. It's going to be showing that that you know certain effects always require cinnabar to precede them <laughs> as their cause, right? Um, uh, so, like, I'm going to have to be able to do that in order to for the empirical concept cinnabar to have the capability that it has to have of representing its object as a cause. So this manifold is have, going to be such that it's going to have to be such that I can synthesize it that way. It's going to have to have those types of regularities that Hume talks about when he talks about cause and effect. Um, and why am I demanding that? Remember, the object has its own principle. And yet somehow I'm dictating to the object. I'm saying, object, your principle must be such as to make my what's manifold in my intuition be collectible in a certain way by the imagination. This new camera is supposed to auto refocus, but evidently it doesn't. Nothing works. It's like just a general principle. This works. That's not good. Didn't even notice when I unplugged it. <laughs> For heaven's sakes. There it is. Okay. Um, oh, and Terry says this happened before, but suddenly it just refocused. Yeah. All right. I guess I just have to wait it out. I don't know. So, like, um, and why am I demanding that? I'm demanding it because otherwise I won't be able to make my empirical concept. Well, why should the object care about that? Right? Like, compare it to the case of the geometrical concept. If I if if I say the object has to appear to me spatially. And you ask why? Why are you demanding that? And I say, well, that's my only capability of being affected, mm -hmm. to be affected in spatial order. Um, then, sure enough, the object has to comply, right? The object can only affect me if it affects me at all in the way I'm capable of being affected. That's the end of the story, right? But in this case, I'm saying the object has to affect me in such a way that I'm able to do my own thing that might apply my own principle. And it's really unclear why the object should cooperate. Right? And that's what makes the transcendental deduction of the categories so difficult and seem at the outset almost hopeless. 
right? Like, how am I going to show that this object um, has to behave in this way? Um, Okay, so I've kind of hinted at this before, but I'm going to talk about it. I, so I think there's one step that is crucial to making this argument, which again, seems like it must be might be hopeless, hopeless to um, um, like, where am I going to get anything from here? There's one step that's crucial to making the rest of it work. Um, and I think the step is something like, If I am a discursive intellect, then right. So another way of putting this is if if I am a discursive intellect is to say if I think right thought is um a, term that Kant uses specifically to mean discursive intellection. So like uh, uh, intuitive intellect does not think. That is, of course, again, we don't know that it's so much as possible that there's an intuitive intellect, but the concept of intuitive intellect doesn't involve thinking. I mean, we have to think it, <laughs> it's a concept, right? But the, the supposed object of it doesn't think. We don't attribute thinking to it. Thinking is discursive intellection. So you could say, if I think then, right? So, um, I think in Latin is ego cogito. And in German is, ich denke, I think. Um, so when, uh, in the course of the transcendental deduction, when Kant keeps talking about das ich, the I, but often translated into English as the ego, um, I think that translation is right in the sense that when he talks about the I, it's always short for the I think. And sometimes, many times, he fills it out, right? So sometimes he says the I, but other times he says the I think, <laughs> right? The 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 central point that the that the deduction is going to the sort of like the Archimedean point, <laughs> um, the deduction is going to be based on that's that's Descartes' metaphor here, um, is the I think. So if I think, then other things are going to follow. So how do I know that I think? And again, this is where I say, like, up to this point, it's actually the same as Descartes' argument, basically. Then immediately it turns out that the, the situation is much more complicated than Descartes thinks. But up to this point, and I think you can you you can see this much later in the paralogisms when he when he um, briefly, without naming Descartes, to, like discusses Descartes' argument in particular. Um, so, like this much of it is right. I can't deny that I think. I can't 
prove that I think from some premise. I mean, Descartes doesn't either, right? Descartes doesn't, Descartes, there's, there's something that looks like an argument, but I think is the premise of the argument, not the conclusion, right? So it's, I think, therefore I am. But it doesn't make an argument to show that I think. Um, or, I mean, there's a kind of argument, but it's not a proof from first principles. And it can't be a proof from first principles. If it were a proof from first, first principles, that would mean that it's necessary that I exist, right? That I must, that, that I couldn't have not existed. If you can prove something from first principles, like, like if you can prove that two plus three equals five, um, based on some necessary truth, through some you know logical uh, process, then two plus three equals five not only is true, but it had to be true. It couldn't have been otherwise. It's a necessary truth. But this, this is not a necessary truth. Right? I mean, it happens that I think, but I could have not existed. I'm contingent. At least as far as I know, right? I can't prove that I exist necessarily. So how do we know this? And um, I think, you know, this is what, so Kant doesn't actually use this phrase in the um, first critique as far as I know, but he uses it elsewhere when he's talking about how the deduction works. argumentum ad hominem. So, I mean, ad hominem means like with reference to the to the human, to the person. Uh, and like, uh, I don't know, did I already discuss this in this class? I don't think so. All right. So I probably discussed in 100B. That's probably what I remember. So like, so one meaning of argumentum ad hominem, art, that is ad hominem arguments, is when, uh, is to describe a certain fallacy where you try to disprove your opponent's position by mentioning some other irrelevant thing that's bad about your opponent, right? And, and I mean, that's not a good kind of argument at all. That's just a fallacy. And that's what we now usually use it to mean. But there's another meaning of ad hominem argument which is um, um, that it means you rely on your opponent's premises to prove something that they now have to accept. Right? So you can get you can get your opponent to accept something by bringing in premises that you don't claim to prove and perhaps don't even agree with. <laughs> but anyway, you don't have to prove them because your opponent is already maintaining them. That's an argument ad hominem in the sense, in the in the good sense, right? So in that sense, it's not a fallacy. Um, it shows that, uh, I mean, it doesn't show that the conclusion is true, but it shows that in order to be consistent, your opponent ought to accept it. So that's what an ad hominem argument is in general. But I think what Kant is thinking about this, like, um, and by the way, I should I should give credit here. I think I first got the I, I know I first got the idea of understanding this this way from uh, Paul Franks, um, who was in grad school with me, and now is a famous more. Well, I'm not sure what he's working on right now. First he worked on Hegel, and then he worked on Newton. But in any case, the, Paul Franks is the one I got this idea from. Um, so like ad hominem here means um, that 
your opponent has to your quote unquote opponent that is they're not really Kant's opponent right but your audience has to accept it because they're humans <laughs> right that is I can't deny that I'm that I'm this kind of intellect because the act of denying or arguing or any of these things is um, um, something that only a discursive intellect could do. So if I'm if there's really an audience for the argument, that is if 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 um, if I'm reading it and I'm not a discursive intellect, then I can't object to it because only a discursive intellect can object. I can't follow the argument because only a discursive intellect follows arguments. And in that case, uh, sure enough, the argument doesn't show anything. The argument only shows that a person who understands it has to accept the conclusion, not that the conclusion is necessarily true. Did people follow that? I know well, there's very few people here, so I don't know if I can ask that. Um, right. And as I was saying, that's exactly what we want here. In in Descartes' case, um it's right, he he um uh, appeals specifically to the ability of his audience to doubt. Right. So like he can't prove that they exist unless they actually can go through the first meditation that is actually have the ability to doubt. Um but you know if they if they don't, if they can't understand the first meditation, then they don't exist. <laughs> And again, it's not necessary that someone exists, right? Like, it's not necessary that anyone is going to understand Descartes. In fact, he's not sure anyone will, right? <laughs> so, I mean, uh, it's, uh, but if they do, the argument has worked. The argument works, right? But it's whoever understands the argument must accept the conclusion, just as in the usual case of an ad hominem argument, who, who, you know, since I already accept the premise, I must accept the conclusion. In this more like weirder case, um, if I understand the argument, I must accept the conclusion. All right. So I think, you know, that's the first step. I said, spent, well, I don't know, it's hard to say. I may have spent too long on that. I'm going to have to rush through how I think the rest of it works. But I think that that's the, I think that's actually the, even though the other details are really complicated and hard to understand, and I'm not sure I understand them, I think that like this is the main thing that explains how we can get anywhere here. So then it goes on to talk about that thinking means using a concept. Now, I mean, that is, it means possessing the concepts, right? That is, it's not as if we've already shown title here in the second step. But if it's true that we think, then it's true that we possess concepts, even if perhaps they're illegitimate, because that's basically like the definition of, um, hold on a second, let me let the count out of here. Oh, All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, and to have a concept means, so I guess rather than using, I should say possessing, thinking equals possessing concepts, and concepts are rules which may apply to 
something manifests. They may apply to more than one case. Maybe I shouldn't say more than one, but it might apply to a case that is Well, a case that isn't unified. I mean, I'm trying to say this very abstractly because again, we're supposed to be working really abstractly in this part of the deduction. What it can, comes down to in our use of concepts is that every time I use a concept, um, I'm using it to refer to a specific case that happened at a specific time, but also in such a way that it could apply to other cases that happen at other times. So like whenever I actually represent an object, meaning that I have an empirical concept and an empirical intuition and I perform the synthesis and all that stuff, um, I'm uh, always representing that um, um, that object as one among possibly many, cases that, that to which that rule applies. Right, so, I mean, using a concept means representing A case as possibly one among others. And this is what Kant, I think this is what Kant calls the analytic unity of apperception. Apperception is Leibniz's term. I, I don't know if it has a history before Leibniz, but I think anyway, that's how it gets to Kant. Um, apperception is Leibniz's term for basically self-consciousness, right? So apperception means like perception of myself or something like that. And the analytic unity of apperception um, as uh, Kant explains it is um, that the I think that's uh, um, included, so to speak, in every concept, that is in every actual empirical concept. In any, or in any concept, actually, any concept at all that I possess, the I think that's included in it um, is uh, includes both the actual opposite object of this representation now and the the objects of other possible representations. So it's a unity of apperception in that is it's a unity of the I think in the sense that it's uh, um, it's the unity of the um, uh, capability of thinking that's exercised in this concept uh like 
taken apart from like abstracted from the um possible manifoldness of its of the objects it applies to So, so far, and by the way, like, except for the first step, which isn't really an argument at all, as I was saying, or not an argument in the usual sense, I think this is all supposed to be analytic, right? That is, the whole deduction is supposed to be analytic, meaning that we're just unfolding the concept, what's contained in our concept of a discursive intellect. And of course, it had better be analytic because it's supposed to be explaining how we can have title to synthetic a priori truths. If it were in self a synthetic a priori truth, <laughs> then it would come too late, so to speak, right? If some of the steps in here were synthetic a priori. So I think the steps are all analytic. So, the, um, so in other words, so the step I'm about to make, which from the analytic unity of apperception to the synthetic unity of apperception, I mean, we're going to show that I can that I'm able to carry out a certain synthesis, and that my ability to carry out that synthesis is um, um, means that a certain concept has that certain concepts have to be applicable. Um, and in that way, we're going to, um, we're taking the step that in the analytic of principles, we're going to be able to use to show that we can make certain synthetic a priori judgments. Um, but so, um, so the, the step we're going for here is what Kant calls the synthetic unity of apperception. And I guess maybe I didn't say this in a very clear order, but what I'm trying to say here is that this word synthetic, um, this analytic synthetic contrast is not, it doesn't mean here we were take, talking about an analytic truth and now we're talking about synthetic truth. It's all analytic. Here we're talking about an analytic truth about the capability of synthesis. And that is related to what we're heading for, that is explaining how synthetic a priori judgments are possible. But um, so it is related to that use of synthesis too, but not directly, or that use of synthetic. So how we, so what is the synthetic unity of apperception and why is it supposed to follow from this one? Um, And I think the answer is that this analytic unity of, pre, of our perception, this presupposes that I could be the same subject in another case. Right, so like every time, so like when I use the concept cinnabar, I'm re I use it to refer to a some piece of cinnabar, let's say. I mean, I can also use it to refer to cinnabar in general, remember, but let's say I'm using the concept cinnabar to refer to some piece of cinnabar. Now, um, um, the the intellectual nature of that representation is it's that is it's being a unified rule combined with the fact that my my intuition is sensible that is contains something manifold that isn't derived from my rule um means that when i'm using that concept i'm at the same time like representing it as possibly applicable to other cases. 
besides this piece of cinnabar I'm thinking about now. But that means that I must be representing myself as possibly there in some other case, using my concept in some other case. Right, so whereas here we were just talking about the fact that the concept is one concept, basically, and would be the same concept in another case. Here we're talking about the fact that I am the same thing in two different cases. And someone asked, is this still the I think? And the answer is, well, um, yes, only it shows that um, the, the I think um, implies that there's something that I can represent as myself thinking at different times. I mean, that is for us, it's at different times, but we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to know yet that the form of our intuition is time and space. So in different cases, um, I see that the time is up. So I'm going to have to, I guess, finish talking about this next time. And next time will be uh, uh, a week from today, right? Also on Thursday. Um, so I will see you then, I hope. Um, Bye.